It's 1963. A young George Seymour has just returned home from 10 years working at sea. He's got himself a nice piece of land, and he plans to raise cattle. You see, George, like many young men, just wants to be a cowboy. To George's great disappointment, he finds his land is mostly swamp, and it's not fit for raising cattle at all. But George is resourceful, and he's not given up on his cowboy dream. His solution? Garbage. Lots and lots of garbage. He begins to fill in his swamp with harmless things, like cardboard boxes and wooden crates. But others soon follow. He puts up fences, but the word is out. And he can't stop the flow of garbage onto his property. In time, George's ranch land becomes the unofficial dump for the island. By 1972, so much garbage is accumulated that the government decides to lease the land and make it official. Georgetown Landfill is born. Our landfill was an accident. And because of this, it lacks some key structural features, the most important of which is a liner. Modern landfills have a series of protective layers and piping beneath them to stop the leaching of contaminants into the surrounding areas. By 1989, many locals suspected that the landfill was leaching into the North Sound. The government responded by allocating $900,000 for a comprehensive study on the site. When the results came out in 1992, it highlighted elevated levels of two very worrying substances, polychlorinated biphenyl, or PCB, and the heavy metal mercury. PCB is a known carcinogen, and mercury concentrations magnify as they move up through the food chain. So given enough time, let's say 23 years, they can accumulate to toxic levels in the top predator species just like that amazing local tuna that the Marriott just fed you for lunch. Got your attention now, right? Now, these findings, they should have generated some quick and decisive action from government. What happened instead was a change in government, shelving of the report, and the start to a cycle of frustration for Cayman residents. Now, each trip around this cycle has been the same as the last. So I'm going to skip through the next 20 years of heartache all the way to here. Remember these signs? 2009, the newly appointed government began searching for a new home for the landfill. And they had a lot of public support. 58%, according to a Cayman Compass online poll at the time. They decided on a Bodentown location. They announced their decision. And then they defended that decision through public forums. This decide, announce, defend strategy has a grand history of failure. The UK government employed it throughout the 80s and 90s in their search for a home for their nuclear waste. It took 21 years of confrontation with communities and almost half a billion pounds spent before they abandoned the strategy and adopted a more voluntary approach. Now, there were no human barricades or violent confrontations with police here in Cayman, but the response of Bodentown residents was very similar to reactions of UK communities. They sensed that decisions were being imposed on them because they hadn't been involved in the planning process. All 1,551 pages of the supporting research was paid for by the developer and was almost impossible for a layman to digest. All of this served to generate mistrust. Trust me, I'm a clever scientist. As much as I love that phrase, it rarely persuades anyone. People like to find out for themselves. Put up a wet paint sign in a public place. See how many people have to go over and verify the facts. <laughs> Having now learned this really expensive lesson, the UK government is putting together an expert third party panel whose sole role will be to provide clarification and impartial advice to potential communities. In the end, Bodden Towners formed a coalition to oppose what they said would surely become Mount Trashmore East. It became a campaign issue, and Bodden Towners voted overwhelmingly to reject the move in 2013. Change in government, shelving of the report, end of another cycle. So where are we now? 
Well, since the rise of the powerful came in NIMBY, the government is sticking tight to that Georgetown site. But the truth is, we're going to move the landfill. And we're going to do it for three reasons. The first reason is space. There's simply not sufficient room at the present site to safely house the future waste of Grand Cayman's growing population. This was made very clear by the government's senior project manager in March of this year. I pounced on poor Jim Schubert at the STEM conference this year and then grilled him on the future of the landfill while he tried to eat his lunch. Uh, he was exceedingly nice throughout the entire ordeal. Uh, the second reason is safety. We've seen periodic fires at the landfill since the mid-1980s. Up until now, our fire department has done an amazing job of quickly surrounding and extinguishing new fires before they can grow too large to control. But with over a million tons of combustible waste standing 80 feet high, we're asking an awful lot of our fire department, and we're taking genuine risks with every year we keep this site open. The third reason we've touched on already. Dangerous contaminants are leaching from the landfill. We've been aware of it since 1992. New samples were taken and tested in April of this year. And when I started down the road to TEDx way back in February, uh, I imagined I'd be revealing the latest disturbing news to you here today. But the government has not made the findings public. I hate to speculate, uh, but I think I can say with, with almost absolute certainty that the last 23 years of inaction will not have made things any better. We need to stop the leaching from the landfill, and we can only achieve this if we capture the entire structure and relocate. So we all agree, right? We're going to move the landfill. So let's now look to the future, because there's a lot to get really excited about. The first draft of the new national strategy on solid waste management should come out this month. It's going to be a fantastic read. I have not been this excited since Star Wars Attack of the Clones. <laughs> the new proposed plan will involve multiple facilities at multiple locations, each dealing with specific waste types. Even modest projections will see 50% of our waste being diverted away from landfill. This means our new landfill will be much, much smaller. And with all our composting waste being treated elsewhere, it will smell much, much better too. There will be no Mount Trashmore East. Most excitingly, certainly for me, will be the opening of a waste to energy facility. A facility that can harness the energy trapped in our garbage and return it to our homes as electrical power. So, with all this excitement to look forward to, what now stands in our way? Well, I'm afraid, at this point, it's actually you. For the national strategy to succeed, you are going to need to adopt what the government calls some key behavioral changes. First one's easy, but it's absolutely crucial. You need to buy less disposable stuff. You need to throw out less reusable stuff. And you need to recycle. Can these three little steps actually have an impact? Sweden thinks so. This is my favorite headline from 2015. Waste to energy facilities in Sweden provide electrical power to over a quarter of a million homes. But the Swedish are now so good at reducing, reusing, and recycling that they've run out of fuel. Sweden now imports over 800,000 tons of combustible waste every year from other countries just to keep their plants running. With only 1% of household waste ending up in landfill, Sweden will not be looking for any new landfill sites, ever. E behavioral change number two. These facilities won't come cheap. Estimates run about $100 million. Now, the government's going to find a private partner to fund this, but that private partner is going to expect a little return on investment. We are going to have to accept household fees for garbage collection. Now, there's going to be resistance on this one. But it's really very simple. Your garbage belongs to you. You made the decision to buy it, and you must bear the responsibility for its safe disposal. Expecting otherwise is simply unrealistic. When we begin to search for a new site again, 
we must consider offering free garbage collection to the host community. Financial incentives of this sort have worked really well elsewhere, and they might inspire many of our local Cayman NIMBYs to reconsider their position too. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, you gotta resist your inner NIMBY. And this is a really hard one for all of us, because it's contrary to human nature. It is natural to want to preserve and protect what's closest to you, your family, your home, your community, your backyard. But it must be done. I live in the beautiful community of Red Bay, and I would welcome the opportunity to work together with the government to bring a state-of-the-art waste facility to my backyard. There. That should spice up the Housing Association barbecue this summer. <laughs> if I get invited. We have an amazing opportunity before us, an opportunity to lead the way in the Caribbean while establishing a safe, clean, and sustainable waste management system. The decisions we make through the public consultations are going to impact the lives of generations of Caymanians to come. Get involved. Attend the public consults. Resist that inner NIMBY. And help me seize this opportunity. Thank you.